Um, the moderator today is Lydia Bayoud. Um, she's with Bloomberg Law. Um, she's a longtime tech reporter and recently has uh, shifted over to fintech and blockchain and really has established herself as one of the top journalists in that area. So I'm going to leave it off to Lydia, the moderator, and uh, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, and thank you to all of you for coming today. We have a really great panel of experts in this space, so I'm, I hope that you all have some really good questions for them. Um, we're going to mix it up a little bit. If you have a burning question in the middle of the panel, raise your hand. Please make it a question. Don't make it a statement. And say who you are and who you're with. Um, if there are no questions, we'll still leave a little bit of time at the end. Um, so for those of you who may have uh, kind of uh, differing levels of familiarity, both with blockchain, the technology, as well as with digital ID, we're going to have the panelists introduce themselves and just give a little bit of information about uh, their role and how they come at this space and a little bit of definition. Starting on my left. Hi, my name is Tiffany Angulo. I'm legislative director to Congressman David Schweikert from Arizona. Um, I guess I'm a little bit different than the folks on the panel. We don't actually invent anything, so I uh, just work for Congress. Uh, so the congressman is actually co-chair to the Congressional Blockchain Caucus. So that's how sort of I'm involved with you know, this specific issue. Uh, we do a ton of, you know, educational briefings, sort of trying to be an intermediary between folks in government and folks at the public or private sector uh, to find out what's happening at the industry level to educate folks in government. Uh, but just wanted to introduce myself. Uh, Dan Bakkenhammer with the Accenture. Uh, I've been doing uh, identity-related programs for the last 20 years, um, including digital identity and, and uh, focusing on blockchain-based uh, digital identity programs uh, for the last three years. Um, uh, apart from being a system integrator, uh, I'm also on uh, uh, ISO standards um, and other uh, standards committees. Uh, ISO TC307, for those that want to know, uh, is the blockchain standards, but there's also others like uh, World Wide Web Consortium, W3C standards, and other uh, affiliations like the Decentralized Identity Foundation that uh, we're involved with. Uh, hi, I'm Amy Kim. I'm, lead, I'm the Chief Policy Officer at the Chamber of Digital Commerce. We're a blockchain trade association. Uh, we've been around for five years. We have over 200 members that span all aspects of the blockchain ecosystem. So from financial services to um, energy to ID to healthcare, you name it. Um, so we do look at it from that kind of holistic uh, perspective and promote the acceptance and use of blockchain technology. Hey, and James Cross from Workday. We're an enterprise software company. We provide human capital management software to around half of the Fortune 50 and nearly half of the Fortune 500. Um, I lead on product strategy for Workday Credentials, which is a new blockchain-based digital credentialing platform focused on workforce and skills and talent use cases that we announced a couple months back. Hi, I'm James Shook. Um, I'm from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, we approach blockchain from original research. We we see that there's a, a need for education in the government and, and you know, economy in general. So uh, we've been producing uh, white papers and IRs and other uh, original research papers. Uh, one in particular that we may talk about today is uh, taxonomic approach to understanding emerging blockchain identity management systems. Uh, so, Just a reminder to the panelists, speak close to the microphone when you speak. It's hard to hear you a little bit at the end, James. So um, I'm going to do a really informal poll of the audience. How many of you care about privacy? Raise your hand. I kind of hope all of you raise your hand, but it looks like most of you are. Um, how many of you wish you could have better control over uh, you know, all the information that's out on you digitally or kind of out in the world? Awesome. OK. So keep that in mind, I think, is uh, with everything happening in Congress, as I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, are aware and may actively be working on, um, the privacy debate, I think, is a really interesting one being introduced into the notions of a blockchain technology as applied to digital identity. Um, I'm going to ask Amy just to give us a little bit more of a, a baseline on the difference between blockchain, crypto, and what we're talking about here as it relates, the good, good news or bad news, depending on your perspective, is we're not going to talk about crypto. We're really focused on blockchain and digital ID. Um, so Amy, why don't you start? Sure. Um, so, you know, blockchain is, is a technology. Um, and it really combines um, some things that have been around for a long time. So you think about ledgers have been around for centuries. 
It incorporates cryptography, which we've also been, you know, for decades. Um, you think about public key cryptography, uh, again, it's, you know, something that's been around for quite a bit of time, but what it does is combine them together in such a way that you can now connect parties who may not necessarily know each other or um, know each other well enough to trust each other, that they now can trust each other with the, kind of the cryptography and the other mechanisms that are in place um, to enable a trusted system um, to be out there. So the first one, you know, the first blockchain implementation that we saw in 2010 was the Bitcoin blockchain. It was a peer-to-peer -peer payment system. So everyone thinks, that, you know, they sometimes can conflate the two, Bitcoin and blockchain. Um, but if you think about it, you have the blockchain as your kind of base layer, and then you can develop applications on top of that type of software. Um, and one analogy that I like to use to help make people under help people understand it a little bit better is, if you think of um, Bitcoin, isn't really a coin. It's more of like a packet, a file, or a packet of information is the analogy I like to use. And so that packet for Bitcoin is, is a Bitcoin, but. It can also be other things depending on how you architect the software. So it could be the title to a car that you track the ownership changing hands over time. Um, it can be ownership or it could be um, uh, a university uh, credential or a degree that you can track over time. Or it can have identifiers as to who you are. Um, and that's, I think, what we're going to talk about today. Dan, I'd like to turn to you. So. Um, Identity solutions, I guess, are not new, but there's some questions around what a digital ID is and what it could be, particularly when combined with blockchain technology. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, where you come at this issue? Sure. Um, and, and I'll start with um, you know, something that many of us have, an uh, electronic passport that's a form of, uh, of digital identity, um, it, it, but it's also a physical document. So one of the, uh, but there's a lot of similarities to what um, we think of as self-managed identity in the blockchain uh, identity space, or what some people call self-sovereign identity. Um, but uh, so within your e-passport, there, there's a chip that has digital information, um, biographic and, and biometric, that's signed by the issuing agency. So our U.S. passports are signed by the Department of State. When we move over to blockchain-based identity, um, there's uh, some things that are very similar that in my digital identity wallet, I will have one or more of these attestations, these, um, these identity uh, attributes that are signed by a, a, a trusted agency. And I can uh, uh, share that information under my control to a relying party, another country, another um, uh, a, a private entity. And what th the main difference is um, with an e-passport, if I shared that information with another country, they would go to a central repository, a public key directory, to check the signing certificate uh, to make sure that the document is properly signed and it hasn't been revoked. With blockchain-based identity, that relying party uh, that I just shared one or more um, uh, identity attributes would go to the blockchain to check that it's properly signed, hasn't been manipulated, and hasn't been revoked. But that's the biggest uh, 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 use of blockchain for that decentralized digital identity. Dan, if I could build on what you just said, I mean, a, a way to think about that too is identity right now is, um, when you think about passports and things, it's, um, it's really dependent on third parties saying who you are, and they're siloed, right? So you're talking about the State Department with the passport, your social security number, your state driver's license, maybe, you know, as I was talking about, maybe your college degree. Um, and those are kind of third party um, validators of who you are uh, for that very specific purpose. And even now, there's kind of these new ideas about who your identity, what your identity is, um, like how many uh, LinkedIn connections you have, you know, this kind of social networking identities that we're building. Um, and I think what you're saying is we're kind of shifting that balance now, trying to bring all of those third parties, all those external indicators into the person who the identity is about. Is that, is that fair? Say? That's right. So my identity wallet could have hundreds of uh, attestations in it. There's no central repository, no big brother that has all those identity attributes except for myself. So I want to turn to uh, Dr. Shook, James. Often having government involved in finding use cases for technology um, is very important 
to a technology, I think, taking off in the marketplace and among consumers, consumer acceptance. You've done some research into blockchain. Um, how are you coming, blockchain and digital ID, how are you coming at this space and, and what do you see, maybe just inform the audience kind of what, what is NIST's role in advising on this topic? And identity management in particular or? Uh, related to your research, yeah. Okay, to the research. Okay, so um, we like to investigate how things could be useful. Um, in, this, in particular, identity management obviously looks like it's going to be useful. And, and blockchain, possibly. Um, and so we, uh, about, a, was about a year ago, we got together and started, we actually thought of our own sort of solution uh, to blockchain, uh, to identity management uh, chain. We, we, did, we tried something. And then we realized there's a lot of other um, already uh, solutions out there that, that we're trying different ways. And so we thought it'd be good to uh, Put a put it all together. Um, look at it. What type of architectures that are, people are using? Uh, look at what problems could occur with those architectures. Uh, is this the, I'm trying to figure out this is the question that you're. <laughs> well, in what role does NIST typically have in developing standards that can then be deployed into um, you know other new technology? Oh, standard, so standards is a whole nother another subject on. So th we're, we're, what we're doing here is just original research, exploring it and trying to educate on here. We're nowhere near setting up a, a standard, for a government standard, but we are working with standard bodies like W3. Well, uh, we are uh, observing members of W3C and... Um, for those who don't know what W3C uh, is. The World, uh, World, Wide Web, uh, World Wide Web Consortium is the W3C. I think, Dan, you said you were participating right, in there. Right. And I think you guys are, we are. also, yeah. Uh, participating in that. Um, so we're observing members of them and w we talked to um, ISO, we're, do we're doing work on some ISO stuff. So there are people that, that do that there. Uh, so in terms of st standards, I don't think we're, we're ready yet to actually standardize anything. This is the first exploration for what, how the technology could be used for blockchain. What are, what are the methods people are doing now? Uh, and uh, what are what are the most kind of uh, can you give the audience who haven't read the report kind of what's the the top line findings? Uh, the, in the top line, like if it, is it useful? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, there are companies out there like Workday and uh, Uport who are who believe this is a useful thing. Um, I'm sure you'll hear hear that from them. Uh, our perspective is. Uh, we're not picking any any winners here, right? We're just looking at what they're doing, reporting on what they're doing, uh, guiding on. We're not really saying pluses or minus. We're just telling you how they could be used. Uh, and you know, so there's some pitfalls in the back, and some of the technologies that still need to be develop, developed, like in the back. You know, so so how? I, let me just go through how this possibly could, this would work, right? So. You're going to create an identity, and that can be done many different ways, right? So you have, you could use, the simplest thing is just to create a blockchain address and use it. You don't necessarily do that. I think you guys use, you're on top of Ethereum. Um, we use Hyperledger Fabric. Okay, all right, okay. So, um, or you can create an identifier, and there's many different ways you can create that identifier. You could have the control yourself, or you could have a central repository that's on the blockchain, sort of the, the monolithic um, uh, control of everything, sort of what we have now. Like if you have a federated, uh, so solution, uh, but, but Google and Amazon are federated solutions, right? You could use one ID to sign into many different places. You could set it up differently in, uh, in the blockchain. Um, so you set up the, the ID, you, get the, you can create these credentials, so these issuers can come and create credentials uh, on your behalf, you can ask them to. Um, and you can present those credentials different ways. The, one of the good things about blockchain was that, in general, it makes things, it might make things easier in terms of identity management, right? There's right now almost everything the blockchain can do is already can be done in the in the traditional way. But the blockchain might have to bring the opportunity to making these things a little easier. Uh, another uh, another advantage here is so, let's say I'm, I create a presentation of my credentials. I can choose what particular. Uh, uh, let's say I go to a bar 
and there's a, a bouncer, and I'm, I want to show that I'm 21 to get in, right? All he has to know is I'm 21, so I can present it in a way that I don't have to expose any other data. I don't have to give him my license. I can just expose that I am 21, and a, you know, we can do this in a cryptographic way, right? Um, so that's the type of presentation you can do with it. Uh, what, what I think you guys were talking about earlier was uh, on rev revocation. I think in the blockchain world, revocation is actually a, a really powerful thing to do there because it's a central spot that you know what you can look at all can the different changes i'm sorry can you explain revocation what do you mean exactly uh so you're giving uh let's say you have a license you get pulled over for reckless driving and they take your license away right so you can also do that for many different types of, of credentials right the the issue is a reliant party or issue or would have to go through intermediaries most likely to revoke that, or the relying party, or the, or the person who's going to accept the credential, uh, would have to sometimes have to go through different p parties. Where the blockchain comes in nicely is that there's one spot they're going to look at it, and those things are done quickly. Uh, James from from Workday, I'd like you to come in. I mean, how do you see the supplying in the 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 work environment? Yeah, we very much approached this from a functional perspective, looking at the future of the workforce and the problems that we saw our customers were facing as they managed their workforces and the skills and, and compliance of their people. Um, so when we look at the workforce of the future, we see from our customers and hear from them that it's getting increasingly complex. Our customers are dealing with different types of labor. They're working with gig workers. They may be working with more contractors and contingent workers than ever before. Um, just full-time employees might be coming in and out of the organization much more frequently. And so the workforce itself, itself is getting more complex. And at the same time, we saw that they still needed to make sure these people were who they said they were. Um, that becomes quite different when you've got a gig worker who's turning up for a few hours to do a particular project. Um, they need to make sure that people are licensed in credentials in healthcare and manufacturing. You need to make sure that people have the right industry credentials to remain compliant. Um, and also we see the talent and skills landscape continuing to evolve as well. As every industry gets reshaped by technology, people need new types of skills to be successful. And companies also need to make sure they have talent pipelines of people with the right skills to kind of drive their businesses forward too. So that's the overall landscape in which we kind of exist with our customers. Um, and at the same time, we, we've seen increasing uh, awareness of data privacy from consumers. Um, I think people are starting to bring those expectations through into the workplace as well. They increasingly expect to be in control of their career data, and they want to know how their data is being used, and they want to get utility from, from their own data. Um, and also, we see our customers... Um, sorry. Um, and also, we see... Um, new technologies like blockchain really maturing to the point where they can start to support enterprise applications. Uh, and so we saw an opportunity to use some of these new technologies to solve some of these problems for our customers, but also to do so in a way that puts users in control of their data. And so that's really where we started out. Um, we've had a team of around 40, 50 engineers working on this blockchain-based credentialing solution for about two years now. Um, we finally were able to talk about this publicly in October at our annual conference. Um, but we've been even in stealth mode inside of Workday for quite some time before that. I think when we looked at the blockchain space, um, we, we've seen lots of press releases, lots of proof of concepts. But what we hadn't seen were very many examples of blockchain being used at scale in production to solve real problems. And before we announced anything, we wanted to have real technology that we could demonstrate. And we were pleased to issue uh, a few 10,000 digital credentials at our annual conference. And we're excited to actually get this platform and the accompanying wallet application, which is called way by Workday, um, into the hands of our, our, our customers and their people early next year. Um, Tiffany, I'm, I'm going to come to you. But real quick, I mean, so you mentioned you've been waiting for this technology to mature, and you've kind of rolled out, uh, sounds like many different things. So I take it, a digital wallet, is that something that people would be able to put on their phone and kind of interact with that way? Um, yeah, so we, we've launched, uh, what we've launched has really two components to it. We have an enterprise platform called Workday Credentials, which allows our customers to issue verified digital credentials. And, and Workday really is a kind of gold standard system of record for over 40 to 42 million employees. Um, we have the, the skills they have. We know which learning courses they've completed. We have records of their employment. And so we can allow our customers to issue digital credentials directly to those people representing um, the things that they know about them as an employer. But it's also a platform that allows third parties and other organizations to use the platform to actually issue digital credentials too. 
And then once those credentials are issued, um, users can use our wallet application, which is called Way2, to actually claim those credentials, securely hold them in a way that's uh, locally encrypted on the device, and then to share them as part of transactions, for instance, when they want to apply for a job, or even when they want to prove their employment and income as part of maybe they're applying for a mortgage or applying for an apartment rental. So they get complete control over which data they're sharing, and that third party can verify through blockchain that that data is digitally signed, that it's valid, and that it hasn't been revoked as well. So it's really a case of giving people this new portable career identity in which every credential within there is, is, is verified and can be trusted by third parties and, and used in the real world in a way that benefits the individual. Well, I'd love to hear a little bit more from some of the other panelists, too, about sort of real-world applications that consumers or businesses or, or industry might uh, be looking at, or government. Um, but, you know, maybe any of you, if you want to address, but kind of what are the steps that still need to happen for... You know, you, it's interesting that you mentioned proving your identity. You know, if you apply it for a mortgage, do you need the banks to accept that form of identity? I mean, what else needs to happen for this to really reach scale in the marketplace? Right. So uh, there's certainly a, a lot of uh, governance, uh, uh, and and as as you're pointing out, um, uh, there's there's human trust and there's uh, there's technology trust. So blockchain more or less solves the technology trust as long as it's it's properly architected with the right security uh, uh, and privacy uh, controls. But the the governance is where you get the the human trust. Um, I'll use the e-passport again. My my U.S. passport, when I travel overseas, there's a certain amount of trust in the, the Department of State did their job in doing the identity proofing and and, uh, and asserting that that this this person uh, uh, whose information is in here is Dan Bachenheimer. Um, well, if I have uh, an attestation from Workday, as, as was just said, well, if there's 42 million uh, employees, that's an ecosystem where they have that trust within that ecosystem. Now, if I'm going to produce, um, as we're doing with known traveler digital identity, um, uh, a, a, an identity attestation um, that's going to be used for travel, similar to an e-passport, but also is going to be used by the private sector, by airlines. And the airline can put a boarding pass attestation in that um, in that document. Well, who else is going to um, uh, trust that? Um, w right now, when we go to a duty-free shop in the airport, you have to show a, a physical boarding pass. Are they going to... Um, trust that um, that electronic boarding pass um, or hotel affinities and, and using um, my digital wallet to hold those or the ed educational um, assets. So there's got to be some sort of um, uh, trust, but there's also got to be, uh, has to be some sort of regulation um, like EIDAS in, in Europe that, that trust did, that, that puts into law that digital certificates can, can be trusted. Um, when Estonia created their national ID, the first thing they did was not touch technology. They wrote a law saying that, um, that a certificate-based claim will be accepted in the pub public and private sector. Can you define EIDAS? Oh, EIDAS is the electronic I ID um, uh, and uh, uh, support services. Something that I forget. Yes, yeah, so yeah, right. Um, but it's 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 to harmonize. Uh, in Europe, uh, each country has an identity card, and what they were trying to do is is harmonize so that if I have a whatever a French identity card and I want to uh, uh, open up a, a, a bank account or get employment in Germany, that Germany will be able to accept that. So they created this ecosystem, a trust network that uh, allows for that interoperability. And Tiffany and Amy, you know, it's, it's interesting to hear what Europe is doing, and, and there are many uh, countries and kind of supranational entities that are looking at digital ID uh, for many different use cases, everything from uh, preventing terrorism and tracking down illicit finance to kind of more mundane stuff about just proving who you are for applying for a job. Um, what do you two, you know, since you both interact or are on Capitol Hill for your for your jobs, how do you view um, kind of what's the tenor of the conversation around this issue right now, and where do you think uh, policymakers or, or regulators um, need to kind of be exploring? Uh, so I think education. We still need a lot of education to be done, especially in Congress. And so we've tried to do a bunch of briefings. So the blockchain round, uh, blockchain caucus 
We've actually done uh, an identity roundtable. Actually, we had NIST come. It was great. Uh, to sort of see where industry was and sort of where government is and, you know, through that. And we've done a bunch of them since then to kind of see. And there are actually a bunch of government agencies that are super interested in using blockchain technology for different forms. Um, but I kind of wanted to back it up, like, a little bit on, you know, why blockchain. Uh, if you and my boss specifically wanted me to talk about this, right now, everybody in here, you're, when you go to college, they hold all your information. When you go to a doctor's office, whether that's a dentist, you know, a primary care physician, wherever, they all hold your information in separate entities. As well as, you know, if you want to go, I'm applying, I'm trying to like buy a house. I can't tell you how many times I've had to give my information several different times. So you're putting trust in all of these entities right now that, you know, how many hacks have we had happen? And so it's, you know, you're right now are putting trust in all of these things. And what we're excited about blockchain is that it has the potential as we're seeing with, you know, some of these cool tech, like, you know, companies, as well as even other countries that are doing it, is you're empowering the individual. And so that's what we're super pumped about. Um, and so that's what we've done, like, these round tables and these briefings to sort of show, you know, blockchain is going to be able to help you have more say, you know, in a permission network, you're able to have either explicit or implicit, you know, permissions. And there's different ways that you can do that. And NIST has an awesome report that I'm still reading through because it's really long and awesome, like, great. But to talk about different kind of blockchains, and so, you know, our job, at least from where I sit, is to make sure that your mind is open, that there's a lot of really cool stuff happening. Um, I found out last month that out of all the countries that you think are ahead on this specific issue, Bermuda has a digital ID right now that is going to allow their uh, citizens to eventually pay taxes using their digital ID, uh, as well as Catalonia. Right, we're not even having this conversation nowhere near at that level right now. And so my sort of role right now is to continue to try to open up, you know, the folks up here, their minds on this specific issue. But, um, yeah, I mean, going back to your original question on legislation. So, yeah, you know, we can pass really cool bills, but we're not having the discussion. But one thing at least our office is trying to do, at looking, the, at looking at the larger picture, is, you know, um, and I know that we have, like, different views on the specific issue, but we've got a lot of states, specifically my boss is from Arizona, we have a blockchain definition. You have blockchain definitions in different states. Uh, they also have a smart contract definition in different states. And so we're trying to also get. Explain smart contract. So, uh, I mean, is somebody easier, better at explaining a smart contract in an easier way than me? It's, a, it's kind of a technology, technological solution that is like an if then scenario. So if a certain set data set happens, then something else is automatically programmed to happen. So, yeah. not on a blockchain. You eBay. Oh. Yeah. Sorry, I thought my. So, like on the first of the month, you know, January first, February first, a thousand dollars will be taken from my account and go to Citibank or Bank of America. Yeah. That's that's kind of what a smart yeah. contract is. A smart contract on a blockchain can do much more complex, and then it uses typically a virtual currency type mechanism to make some payments. But that's that's kind of how you could think about it. Yeah. Um, and so we are trying to have, so my boss last Congress, and we're going to be reintroducing uh, this Congress as well, a, uh, last year it was H.R. 7002, Blockchain Records and Transactions Act. Uh, so again, we want to bring clarity to that specific issue and just try to get ahead of it and start having the conversation on, there's a ton of different kind of varying views or varying definitions on this, and to make sure that we don't, because especially as technology advances, and our, my boss is a super big proponent on, you know, we need to have future-proof tech, future-proof legislation, and so we want to make sure that, you know, especially in this space, we don't have, you know, having different standards at different states doesn't impede, you know, transactions or different smart contracts to occur across state lines. Um, so, very long thing. Amy, what's your perspective? Uh, yeah, that? sure. I guess starting from the beginning and going towards the end. Um, you know, with respect to digital identity on a blockchain, I mean, it really, I think it's one of, um, it has the ability to be transformational in so many other areas of blockchain technology and even non-blockchain uses. When you think about digital identity, I, uh, Tiffany had mentioned one, you know, when you're applying for a mortgage or, I mean, any of these, uh, your TSA, you know, or um, to when you're traveling, all of these things, I mean, it can really transform the way that we think about our identity, the way that we're able to manage it. Um, and if you think about, you know, when the Internet, how it exists today, 
um, it's really insecure. I mean, we have passwords and other things and, um, and, and um, SSL type protections, but you know, as Tiffany mentioned, there's, there's a hack. I mean, we hear about those all the time. We're probably all signed up for free for certain you know, services to protect against that. I mean, and what blockchain technology is that like next generation technology with cryptography that enables value transfer in a more secure environment. And so when you think about value being identity, how you secure that, um, and then how you manage it, um, it really can be transformational in so many areas. So one, that's the way we approach it, you know, why it's so important. Um, second, uh, it's also one of the more complex because there are so many potential feeds into it, um, whether you're talking about the federal level with the State Department or internationally or your local or your um, you know, local organizations or your work and, you know, educational and work history or your social interactions online. Um, all of those things can play into it. So it can be quite complex. And so we're very encouraged by specific programs like you both have described and there's others that look at here's, you know, how to manage workplace credentialing. Um, you know, those kinds of things because you have to start in a manageable place to help build up um, and then show that it works and why it's so beneficial. Um, so that's, I guess that's where I'll leave it at that. I I hope I answered the question you had. <laughs> sort of. Um, but we're going to keep moving. <laughs> you know, the there's kind of the... California has a privacy law that's coming online next year, as I'm sure you all know, and some of you I can see are very excited about. How, and obviously then there are GDPR uh, compliance issues. I don't know how many of you probably had to click through some sort of employment. You know, yes, I will protect all of our customer in my, you know... Ident identification, and you probably already had to do those things for, for work. How, t how does either kind of are in the U.S. these state, uh, different state rules about privacy and the ability to revoke, uh, you know, information that companies or entities hold about you uh, and work towards, you know, a federal privacy law, how is that going to interact with digital ID generally and then something like digital ID on a blockchain where I think people would wonder if it's on a blockchain, is it there forever? Can I revoke some of my ID? How would that work? I don't know who wants to address that. Um, uh, sure. In, in the um, uh, patterns established by the Decentralized Identity Foundation and, and others, um, uh, first of all, there, there is no identity information uh, on chain. The only thing that uh, is on chain in that pattern are uh, are public dids. Uh, um, kind of like in, in the in internet, it's like a, a, D, a DNS, a domain name service, so that if you were going to Accenture.com, what's the, uh, the DNS has the URL, the, the actual number for that. So that's basically um, at a very high level what the blockchain holds for, only for public dids. So if I'm an issuer or a verifier, if I'm a government entity or a, 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 a private entity that is um, either issuing or verifying verifying identity claims, their public DIDs are on chain. Me as an individual, my private DID is in my identity wallet. All my attestations are in my identity wallet. None of it's on, on chain. Um, so um, when we talk about revocation, what, what, uh, so what an issuer issues in decentralized identity are, uh, are verifiable credentials. A verifiable credential is one or more verifiable claim. When, uh, when it's revoked, um, an accumulator cryptographic uh, accounting scheme on chain gets updated when you issue a verifiable credential or when you revoke it, you update it again to see that it's revoked. But there's no uh, private information. It's just uh, a cryptographic representation of the verifiable uh, claim. I, I know it's getting a little bit complicated, but bottom line, there's no personally identifiable information stored on chain. And that's exactly how we've implemented it. So when somebody has the career profile, all of that data is stored locally at the edge on their device. It's only a reference to the DID or a cryptographic reference that's actually written to chain. So if somebody wants to delete that data, they just wipe it from their device and there's then no record of it. So um, we, we've been very careful from the start to, I guess, build this solution with all of, these, all of this privacy legislation, both in the EU and also in the US in mind. James at NIST, is this something that NIST has looked in at? And this may not be in your field, but kind of is, have you all explored if there's a privacy angle 
around uh, you know blockchain and digital ID at all, or blockchain more generally? Oh yeah, I, 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 yeah, we definitely consider the, the privacy aspect of this stuff. I, I, even in the paper, we we have a section in the back where we we, we talk about this. Um, privacy is important. We care about it a lot. Uh, so, I don't really want to say any policy. Type, type questions there. By the way, any opinions I express are, are mine and not the, the government's. <laughs> <laughs> right, but um, so we, we do address that in the back. That is a pitfall of doing uh, identity management on there. What they described is a decent solution uh, for doing that, right? So it, things that are verifiable can be cryptographically verified and you put that on there. Mm -hmm. um, and that just pr helps with the privacy. Uh, aspect of that, um, there are so, there are solutions that do have some some privacy uh, information online, and you have to consider the various uh, governments and 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 their issues of doing that. Right? Uh, we this paper doesn't focus on the privacy aspect. We just sort of go through the what the architectures are, um, and we let the the companies figure out how they're going to abide by the laws. But we do point out that there are laws and. Um, uh, uh, other concerns, the government's concerns. For instance, if you have a contract online on, on the blockchain that governs your um, your solution, and you want to update it, who can update it? How's that going to work? There's all sorts of issues on that. Thank you. Um, so, James or Dan, I think an important question here is also to ask: Well, what happens when someone is kind of not in? The mainstream system, you know, James, you mentioned looking at this as a solution for people who are gig workers who um, maybe or maybe are self-employed. And I believe Accenture has a program working with the United Nations to help refugees kind of have some sort of credential. Because I'm sure you can imagine when you have to flee your country, you're probably not thinking like, do I need to take whatever my birth certificate is? You know, you may be in a really terrible situation. You don't have time or or the forethought to do that. So. Or, and we have a lot of trouble with people in this country being able to access identity solutions, whether it's just a basic driver's license or other forms. You know, have you explored how this can be used to help people who either are in, in stable work conditions, in stable kind of living situations? How would this apply to them? So you're making sure that people aren't being left behind in a way by technology. Uh, initial crack at it, but um, right. So in um, uh, in the ID twenty twenty uh, uh, prototype that that uh, you mentioned, um, the uh, the idea is that uh, if you're a refugee getting processed by by the UN, uh, conceptually, uh, you, uh, whether you had documentation or not, you you would be biometrically registered uh, and then uh, provided uh, a blockchain based identity that as you um, got immediately Organizations or education, you could get all these attestations, and then ultimately, you know, potentially get uh, get employment uh, based on the, the the fact that you could prove your identity, prove that you're immunized, prove that you have some skills. Now, um, but that even that that prototype that we did uh, was a, a device based, a, a smartphone based. So, what if they don't have those type of resources? So, um, there's a, 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 this concept of custodianship. So. So you, um, so in, in an example that we have not implemented this, but an example, an entity like the UN could be a custodian. They could have, a, a, let's say, a cloud-based um, uh, identity wallets for n number of uh, of refugees, uh, and only the refugee would have the ability to access that information to share it with um, an employer or something like that. But the UN would be a custodian uh, in that example, but would not have access to that information. Yeah, and, and we think these technologies could actually be most impactful for people who aren't very well served by the traditional education system today. So if you think about maybe a worker in a fast food restaurant who likely doesn't have a college degree, um, we were actually working with a, a large national fast food chain as one of our design partners for this solution who actually wants to create a culture of learning uh, for their employees. They want to attract talent. They want to retain talent. They want to upskill people while they're with them. But they recognize that people likely won't be with them forever. And then they want to send them out into the world afterwards with credentials that actually have some utility, that help them show the, the skills they've gained, that help them get their next job. And that actually, everybody benefits there. The employer benefits too, because then they're creating a great employer brand, of an employer that kind of cares about people, helps upskill them during their time with them. And the employee obviously benefits too. And so uh, we, we see kind of use cases right across the workforce spectrum, but we're partic particularly excited by um, 
by, by those kinds of use cases. Um, we also have a new technology called Skills Cloud, which is a common set of 55,000 skills that all of Workday's customers and all of our applications across our platform now speak. So that becomes really powerful when you have people earning these credentials that have skills t attached to them that they can be used to uh, be matched to opportunities and to apply for jobs. And when they apply for a job with this new digital identity through Workday Recruiting or another recruiting platform, the hiring manager or recruiter can actually say, yes, I know this person has this work history. I can verify that instantly. I know they've gained these skills. I know they've done this learning. And um, hopefully that will uh, kind of reduce the, the time to hire and actually getting people, getting people set up in organizations too. And if I could chime in, so another example my boss is super interested in exploring is the homelessness issue. So in Arizona, we have actually, it's like a, a huge shelter that uh, folks can come in. I mean, if you're homeless, I would imagine you're going to be losing your ID several times and having to authenticate yourself every single time is going to be an enormous burden. And so one thing that they're trying to do at that specific shelter, they're not using blockchain, which like we're hoping that maybe that could change, uh, is to start giving printing IDs and having the IDs attached to the person. And sort of where my boss is coming from the ideas, imagine if you could not only give the individual their ID, but then also find out, you know, hey, this person is on SNAP benefits, or hey, this person has, you know, whatever like government assistance that can be attached to the individual to make sure that they can get the help that they need, whether that's as well like healthcare. You know, if they have, you know, they know that they're on this specific kind of medication. Again, you can allow specific permissions and you can ask that individual, hey, am I allowed to look at this, you know, to try to help you? And like at, at this specific shelter, they also have like, you know, dentists that you can go and like, again, and so we're just trying to look at, you know, there are so many different potentials to help, especially in this space, individuals that right now are being left behind. And whether that's refugees or the homeless population, you know, we can definitely and we absolutely do need to ask questions about privacy to make sure that things are secure. But right now, there is a potential solution to this. And we want, you know, again, from where I sit, to make sure that people have an open mind on this is a technology that can potentially solve this problem. So. so I'm going to open it up to questions very s Oh, we have a question. Go ahead. Please say your name and who you're with. Loudly. Hi, I'm Alan McQuinn on the House Science Committee. I have two brief questions. I want you to answer both of them. Um, I know in the cybersecurity world, this often creates uh, uh, programming for years out. Uh, so after you've developed this great taxonomy for blockchain uh, in digital identity, what's, what are the next uh, projects you were thinking about taking on, and then one generally for the entire panel. Um, oftentimes this is the case with digital identity or these big problems, there's a chicken or egg challenge, right? Once you've developed the system, you have to get people to adopt it, otherwise it won't be of no use, including on the employer side. How are you thinking of creating this incentives as you develop the program, especially from Workday, to get more people to buy in? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so. What NIST is doing currently is we're trying to educate. So we started off with an IR two years ago. I think it's been two years. Um, we did a blockchain IR. Uh, the, we just did this white paper on identity management. So we're looking at particular areas that would be useful to, to, to teach the government, because people call us all the time asking us questions. And so we write papers on those topics. So in the, I, I know of a couple different IRs or white papers um, tell you we're working on one with uh, on consensus algorithms so that's one of them where we're going through and we're looking at it and we do give some guidance on that uh, there's another one I'm not gonna give into the details of that one because I I'm not working on it so I want to keep that one to itself but we are doing certain things and we also do individual research papers uh, we've done public ran research paper on public randomness we've done um, various things on cryptocurrencies uh, distributed storage. Uh, I wrote a paper last spring on distributed storage. You can find that on the archive, I think, or ePrint. Um, we did, we have a couple more papers coming out that other authors are, I won't talk about their work because I don't know when they're public. But um, we do have a lot of stuff coming out. And so, in terms of identity management, I don't have anything to say on what we're doing with that after this. how to get this technology out there and how to kind of bootstrap the network and demonstrate some use cases. 
I guess we're very much an enterprise software company. We're really good at using technologies to solve like complex problems for the workforce, for the world's largest companies. And that's really where we're starting with this. Um, if you can imagine one of our large healthcare customers, um, it can take them up to 90 days to recruit and onboard a nurse because they have to verify their identity, they have to verify all their licenses, and you've got this really valuable resource kind of sat on the sidelines for that period. Um, that means kind of lost revenue and, and, and loss of resource for the, for the employer, but it also means you've got this kind of person sat on the sidelines too. So if we can make it easy for our customers to actually manage the credentials and identity of their people, we're solving a large enterprise problem there. And when we look across Workday HCM, we're seeing over 100 million credentials and certifications being managed by our customers. But today, behind every one of those is probably a piece of paper and probably teams of people manually checking all of these licenses. And so we think that by solving some of these enterprise use cases, um, we can start to demonstrate the value of this. And we're also adding value for that nurse as well and for the end user too. So it's really by tackling some key enterprise use cases that we're looking to actually get this technology out there when we launch it next year. Yeah, and, and yeah, on adoption. So uh, I, I did mention uh, the, this known traveler digital identity KDTI, which will have two governments uh, involved, three air, three airports, two airlines. Um, a lot of entities are waiting for the results uh, of this, and you can go to kdti.org, ktdi.org, um, and and get a bunch of background information, a nice little video. Um, uh, but uh, yes, a lot of uh, entities are are looking to that. Uh, before they decide what their next step is. Um, and it just you know, to Dr. Shook's point, uh, the, the, the NIST interagency report, the IR that you were talking about, 8202 is very good. It's, it's an introduction to blockchain. The initial release was more cryptocurrency based. The final release on 8202 was more generic. And it's a very good reference uh, document. So thanks, thanks for that. Well, uh, I'd love to hear more about how, you know, you kind of create a groundswell for this technology to really go out into the market. But I see we have a lot more questions. And um, I'm going to start with you and the scarf. Can you say your name? Oh, are you, you're both in scarves. Red scarf. And then we'll go to green scarf. So uh, we've learned about like a number of different uh, government applications that I would imagine that most Hill staffers have no idea. So we learned the hugest one that I love to talk about is uh, HHS has a blockchain for uh, purchasing data, for all the purchasing that they do. So it uses AI and blockchain to essentially the program is called like Buy Smarter. Um, and essentially they're able to find out, you know, what the cost of a specific good is over time. And so using the program, they were able to figure out, and my favorite example is latex gloves. They were able to figure out that at any given time in any contract, you can pay four cents to 59 cents per glove. That is a huge variation. And so using the program, now they're able to buy smarter so that in every contract, they're able to be better, have more tools at their disposal to negotiate for these contracts and essentially save taxpayer money you know, in the grand scheme of it. Um, and so, you know, th it was huge. And so they had a need. They wanted to find a way to, you know, make the process more streamlined. And as well, they have, you know, I think the other cool example that they talk about is, you know, they have people that came to HHS to combat uh, cancer. And they're going into these projects and they're spending weeks essentially authenticating the same thing, applying for the grants, going through the same thing, filling out the same paperwork every single time, and they're wasting valuable you know, time that they could be using to actually get into the problem. And so now they have this program that is able to even streamline that process, where once you fill out the information about you know, what you're looking for, you don't have to do it every single time, so you're cutting the time of paperwork. Um, and so like again, you know, going to like what Workday is doing that we're super excited is credentialing. In our district, you know, super big healthcare base, and I can't tell you how many times we've had people come in that they're like, we have a workforce shortage and we need people to come in. And then when we do have people come in, it takes like six weeks to onboard them because we have to call every single thing to make sure that everything checks out. And it's how cool would this be to literally have the credential attached to you so when you go and apply, you can be like, here's all my stuff and I can get you to work much quicker, and you can go to helping people much faster. So if that helps answer. 
Anyone else on the panel with some thoughts on that? I was going to say something very similar. So HSPD-12 got us the PIV card, right, uh, our personal identity verification. But that's all it can do, right, is, is verify uh, I'm Dan. It doesn't say that I'm certified to, you know, uh, as a first responder or this or that, right? All those credentials, all those attributes are not on that card. That's one of the things that that, that blockchain and this type of uh, uh, identity-based blockchain can do. All those attributes associated with the individual travel with the individual. Lady in the yeah. green scarf, yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> um, I, 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 yeah, so uh, technically, yes, <laughs> but um, even uh, I, ICAO, uh, International Civil A Aviation Organization, the UN entity that defines passports, um, has defined uh, the digital travel credential. It's, it's similar to what we're talking about here. It's not blockchain-based, but even that, they're going to have a, a digital travel credential, but you're still going to be required to have a physical credential with you. Um, I think it's similar to what we see with mobile driver's licenses in the pilots today. Yes, you might have a phone-based driver's license, but I think for the next several years, you're still going to be required to have a physical document with you. Yeah, and, and technology issues. What if you don't have um, uh, access, right? What if your battery dies or, or the police officer's battery dies, right, to check your, your digital credential? Sir, please. Your name and who you're with. Yes, uh, I'm Amit Sharma. I'm uh, I'm stuck in Florida. I'm a super enthusiast. Uh, my my question is: in the age of quantum computing, which is a new way of computing, uh, the so prime it's... numbers and the factoring of prime numbers, which underlies the entire security and tamper-proofness of a blockchain, <coughs> are, are 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 there some threats? Yeah, Dr. Shook, I don't know if you want to take a crack. So, uh, as you know, NIST is holding a, a, a not a competition on uh, quantum cryptography in the few. So it's going to be a few years before we get a, an answer on that. Uh, we do talk about it briefly in the in the paper that that's, as an issue. Um, a lot of these things, these public key cryptography things, should be replaceable when there's a, you know, these quantum algorithms come out. You should just be able to stick it in. And, not to worry about. Uh, yeah, and, and I'll just be really brief. One of the reasons why we're not putting PII, including encrypted PII, on chain is, is, is partly because of that, because you will be able to decrypt it uh, uh, most likely. But that's one of the reasons why. But it's only public information that's being stored on chain. Sir, on the green sweater. One kind of related scenario we've been building for is what happens if somebody loses their phone or destroys their phone or gets a new phone. Uh, so the way we've tackled, and when we talk to end users and consumers, that, that's the most frequent kind of scenario we see coming up. Um, so the way we've tackled that is having, when they sign up, they're able to create a cloud encrypted backup of their credentials that's signed with their private key. Um, there is an open question around what's the best way to get people to kind of be able to restore their private key itself. Um, we've settled on using passphrases right now, but we recognize there's lots more work that needs to be done around that to make that usable to a broad, broad selection of the population. But that, that's a really interesting question. Yeah. Uh, yes, you in the back. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I mean, that's why we're trying to like get that conversation even going, you know, with sort of the bill that we're trying to pass where it's like essentially adopting, allowing, you know, uh, signatures, what was it? Signatures, records, and smart contracts to be sort of, so it, and the bill itself would be amending e-sign to essentially have some of that, you know, like preemption within the states. Um, and we've been like crafting that carefully. My boss from Arizona, so we're super libertarian, so we don't want to tell a state what to do, but there are states that are way ahead and we don't want to hinder them later on if, what it, for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, so I, not necessarily with like the digital identity space, but Arizona passed a uh, FinTech sandbox. Super great, awesome, killing it. But we've had even a district company move overseas because at the end of the day, you still have to like adhere to the federal government. And so they didn't get enough clarity and it was gonna be too complicated and too expensive. And so they had to move overseas. And that is not what we wanna see. Um, and so, you know, the states can do a bunch of really great stuff. Arizona's been trying to lead on that. But at the end of the day, we need to have the conversation here as well. So, so I think we have time for one more minute and I wanna see if anyone from this side of the room Oh, there. I couldn't see your hand. Please, sir. Uh, can you stand up and say who you're? Who yeah, you're my name is Todd Miller. I'm a Chrome engineer for a blockchain technology company. But a uh, question for the panel in terms of this challenge between permissions and the public record. Because I guess the fear is, is that if we um, sort of solve the solution through enterprise systems, you're still going to develop the same sort of balkanized uh, kind of walled garden Yeah, so I, I could start. So the, the, I, I think of it in four dimensions. So there's public and private, and there's permissioned and permissionless, right? So public versus private is who can access uh, the chain, and permission versus permissionless is who can update it, okay? So two different dimensions there. So Bitcoin is public and permissionless. Um, and, you know, uh, you mentioned consensus. So that has a much more rigorous consensus mechanism because everybody can uh, both access and update uh, the, the ledger. So where, uh, especially where, where um, we sit, uh, we, Accenture, we, um, uh, the permissioned ledgers uh, for identity applications um, we think are, are uh, most appropriate. Um, uh, yes, it, to your point, it does, uh, it, it does, uh, uh, create boundaries, but I think they're necessary. Um, and and for for that reason. So yes, the public could, it still can be public, so everybody uh, can access it, but only um, uh, certain entities uh, can update it. Anyone else on the panel? Yeah, that's the exact same approach that we've taken with Workday credentials. Um, the chain itself is public. Anybody can verify it to check that a credential is valid, but then only a small group of people can actually write to the chain. Um, and we're building a nonprofit entity for, as a kind of credentialing consortium to manage the governance of, of, of the underlying blockchain itself. Um, we're also firm believers in open standards. Um, our vision is for credentials issued on our platform to be interoperable with other networks and other platforms and vice versa. So if an individual gets credentials from different places, they can collate them in one place and use them across different ecosystems and get broad value from them. So we're big believers in open standards. We're also involved in the Decentralized Identity Foundation. Um, we believe that decentralized identity will t play a big role in the enterprise in the future. And really we want to bring our knowledge of the workplace and the world of work and the labor market to the, to the table to help shape those standards as well. All right, I think we're gonna end it up there. Thank you all for really great questions and thanks to our panel. Sure.